Okay, so in 1999, this sculpture, titled Eke Homo by Mark Wallinger, debuted in the public space of Trafalgar Square. It's a life-sized Christ figure on a podium, or more appropriately, a plinth, that is clearly intended to support a much larger character. The figure, standing on the very edge of the plinth, consequently appears small, humble, vulnerable. His eyes are closed, his head is wrapped in gilded barbed wire, his hands are tied behind his back. The other plinth of this size in the square holds something much more conventional, an equestrian statue of George VI, and the two other plinths that define the dimensions of this square hold Sir Henry Havelock and Sir Charles Napier, two British generals associated with the British 19th century involvement in India. So yeah. A king known for living large, sculpted in a classical equestrian pose, two imperialist generals, and one bald, humble, and vulnerable Christ figure. One of these things is not like the others. And today, I want to talk about why and how this happened. So first, Eke Homo was installed on this plinth in the northwest corner of London's Trafalgar Square, and it is known as the fourth plinth. This is because those other three plinths in the square have had permanent sculptures on them. This one, though, this one remained empty for a good bit of time. So it's the other one, the last one, the fourth plinth. Trafalgar Square was redesigned and reopened in the 1840s to commemorate the naval victory over the French in the Napoleonic Wars. It has its tall tribute to Lord Nelson and those famous lions and all of that, but it also has these four plinths set up on the corners of the square. The fourth plinth on the northwest corner was originally intended to display an equestrian sculpture of William IV, the brother of George VI who is on the plinth across the way. Money was never actually budgeted for the sculpture though, so it just didn't happen. And so the empty plinth became known as the fourth plinth, and it sat that way for a long time, like 150 years. During that time, once in a while, someone would argue that Winston Churchill should be put there, or some other figure associated with empire, war, or the monarchy, or whatever. But it got serious when Prue Leith, currently of Great British Baking Show slash Bake Off fame, but in the mid-90s she was, among other things, deputy chair of the Royal Society for the Arts, and she decided to do something about that fourth plinth. A committee was formed, and they interviewed 17 artists. Among those 17, three were chosen. Mark Wallinger, Bill Woodrow, and Rachel Whiteread. The plan was that each of these artists would design a sculpture for the plinth, and over a period of two years, from 2000 to 2002, those sculptures would be displayed, one at a time, and after that, a public vote would determine which one became permanent. The first sculpture was Eke Homo, and it was quite a statement. To have a small, unintimidating character occupy a space clearly meant for some traditional expression of bravado, grandeur, and strength. The result is that the other sculptures kind of look foolish. The genuine humanity of Eke Homo makes the other sculptures look like expressions of some schoolyard bully chest-beating insecurity. The Christ figure seems authentically self-possessed and confident, thus highlighting the inadequacies that hide behind equestrian bravado. As Richard Dormant of The Telegraph put it, what Wallinger has done is to turn Trafalgar Square into something akin to a vanitas, a meditation on the transience of earthly things, making all other statues in the square look hopelessly pompous. The sculpture itself is intended to be a Christ figure standing before the lynch mob that will call for his execution. Essentially, this figure stands in front of one of the most trafficked areas in all of Europe, waiting for judgment. So the sculpture is obviously communicating with the symbols of military power on the other plinths, but it is also in communication with the general public that walk through that square, Trafalgar Square, the site of political protests and celebrations. This thing is working on a ton of levels. And not only that, but this is England, a Protestant nation that had dissolved its monasteries back in the 16th century. 
physical depictions of Christ are simply not common here and haven't been common for a long time. So it's in communications with England's religious history as well. The artist, Mark Wallinger, said of the sculpture, For a believer, this is the moment when the human Christ faces up to his divine destiny. For the non-believer, it is the point when a political prisoner who is a danger to both the religious orthodoxy of his own people and the occupying power of imperial Rome is placed before a lynch mob. He will die for his minority religious beliefs, but the sculpture depicts a moment just beforehand, before we have belief or certainty. And I think, in retrospect, the success of the work can be attributed to this sense of a real temporality that is that very moment set in stone. In addition to all this, it works on the level of global politics. Christ is a political prisoner here. It could be read as a statue about the role of democracy in protecting the vulnerability of the minority, rather than being a weapon for the majority to impose its will on others. So this sculpture was pretty popular. It's pretty good. It started a lot of good conversations. I want to make future videos on the other submissions, but for now, I want to continue with the history of the plinth itself. When the two years were up, Eke Homo proved to be the most popular. But that same year, the responsibility for the maintenance of the square shifted to the mayor of London's office, and the resulting bureaucracy left the plinth vacant once again. In that time, a new plan was hatched. The discussions around the sculpture that appeared between 2000 and 2002 were so interesting and robust that they decided to continue with a rotation of contemporary sculptures. The Fourth Plinth Commission was established, and now artists propose works for the site, the public votes, and then Victoria sculptures can sit in Trafalgar Square for up to two years. It's been called the world's smallest sculpture park. And I can't help but think that something like this might be useful in the United States where there are an increasing number of empty platforms ready for good public art that can inspire conversation and civic engagement. Just spitballing ideas here, I don't know. Contemporary art is often seen as something pedantic, something to be discussed in the ivory tower of academia or the art world, something that you need to know a lot about before you can participate in a discussion about it. Which, you know, obviously I would push back on, but I want to acknowledge that this opinion is popular and that it exists. But this plinth has, for the last 20 years, become a place where the contemporary art world has been invited into the public sphere to be commented on, ridiculed, admired, whatever. People talk about it. The type of sculpture that typically appears in modern art museums is viewed by a self-selecting public willing to engage with it. To have that sculpture appear on the fourth plinth, however, is to expose it to a huge and diverse set of eyes. Artwork displayed on this plinth is discussed by tourists new to London, by cab drivers who know London's every corner, by academics with a background in art theory, by people who purposefully avoided every art class they could, and by everybody in between. These sculptures are designed for the plinth and therefore have to communicate not only with the public, but with the context of Trafalgar Square. To design something for the plinth is to have your work exposed to both the London rain and the London gaze. As I said, I hope to be making a few more videos that highlight some of the works that have appeared on the fourth plinth over the past 20 years. If you want to be notified about when those come out or when anything new comes out at all, please subscribe and thank you for watching.